Hi there and welcome to this fully updated and revamped super long tutorial where I will be completely demonstrate to you how you can build your own fully automated algorithmic crypto trading bot. In this tutorial I will show you the following things. Part 1 will show you how you can create the necessary infrastructure. I will create a virtual server in the cloud and secure it. In part 2 I will install the software components needed. I will install Docker, Docker Compose and the Fractrade trading bot itself. This will be a step up to part 3. In part 3 I will run through all the most important configuration options of the Fractrade bot. I will also show you how to enable the web interface and Telegram capabilities to manage it from your other devices. And when I'm finished with this part, I can technically run the bot and do automatic trading. But wait, there's more! In part 4 I will show you how you can download data, do backtests and analyze these results with the plotting capabilities. Then you can make your own informed decisions if a strategy is worthwhile to run or not. In part 5 I will show you how you can create your own simple strategy for trading with futures so that you can do long and short trading. And finally in part 6 I will end this video with some final words around trading with an algorithmic trading bot. So, as you can see, this will not be a quick and dirty installation procedure, but a full tutorial that will get you up and running with your trading bot before the next bull run starts. I will explain some of the most important installation, configuration and bot management items at a slightly higher level, but enough to get things working. But if you want to know the nitty gritty about all the configuration options to set up your own trading bot, then please watch my YouTube playlist about the Fractrade trading bot. It is an excellent resource for information about all the most important functionalities of the bot and sometimes does a deep dive into specific important options. Also, in almost all of my other videos I explain something technical about the strategy I test. Each video is therefore a great resource of information on how to code your own strategy. My goal for now however is to demonstrate how to create a fully working trading bot with a simple strategy so that you can be prepared for the next bull run. I hope you find this tutorial useful and wish you all the best at creating your own crypto trading bot. And of course before I even start with explaining stuff, here is the mandatory warning. Trading and especially crypto trading has huge risks and everything you do is your own responsibility. Always think twice and do your own research before you do anything with trading in general. If you have followed the news over the last year, and I think you did, you can see that even with the best possible trading strategy you can lose your money because an exchange or other crypto institute can get bankrupt. And I can tell this honestly because it also happened to me unfortunately. Now I'm also not responsible or accountable for faulty installations, setup or strategies that you use and lose your money with. If you want some professional advice, then consult a professional and not some random internet dude like me. And also trade with money that you are willing to lose. So do not sell your car or house or get in debt to trade with that money. You are taking too much risks if you do this. And finally, if you experience problems with what I show in this video and you want to solve it, then read the manuals, look for solutions on the internet or contact the original developers of the software. You would not believe how many questions I get about installation problems, software errors or wrong setups for which I'm not responsible or have the answers for. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new virtual cloud server at my provider Linode. There are many excellent cloud service providers where you can create virtual servers in the cloud like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Vulture and many more. But I prefer Linode, so that's what you will see in this video. I also have a special offer for a cloud server if you want to create one and test with it by yourself. You can find the link in the description of this video. And please use that link to get the benefits for that offer. Ok, you can see that I am logged in at Linode and I am going to create a brand new trading bot server from this page. To start with that, I will click on the blue create Linode button in the middle of the screen. 
the provisioning page appears and from here I can choose a distribution to use for my server. Since I have pretty much experience with Debian based systems and since Ubuntu is a pretty well known distribution, I'm going to use that distribution for this server. But as you can see, there are plenty of other distributions to pick, so pick one that you prefer. For this video I have to say however that if you do pick another distro that is not working with apt based packages, then you will have to find out how to install and configure certain software packages for that distro. But once you have installed docker and the fractrate image, then the commands will be pretty much the same. So here I'm going to pick the Ubuntu 22.04 LTS version for my server instance and then continue to pick the region where the server should reside. Selecting the region the server should live in should be done with the exchange you want to use in mind. This decision has to do with the distance from the server to the exchange and the latency of the network that can have an influence on the communication between both ends. So if you choose an exchange that is located in the Asian Pacific region, like I think Binance is, then create a server in that region. And if you use an American based exchange, then the chances are pretty high that they are located in the US and therefore you should choose the American region. Of course you can discuss if this really will be an influence on trading, but if you trade on higher time frames, you are probably right. But when you are bot trading on lower time frames, let's say a minute, then I think it will be of much influence. It's not for nothing that big firms that do algo trading or high frequency trading have direct connections to the exchanges. So why don't I use the same principles here? The following thing I have to decide on is the capacity of the server. This decision depends on how much I will make use of the server. If I create one or two docker based bots, then a dedicated CPU or shared CPU will do fine. But if I want to create a whole bot army and wanted to use also web servers and other docker containers on the server, then I should really think of creating a server that can handle these workloads. And of course my budget has also a great influence on my decision here. But for this demonstration however I will make use of a dedicated server with 4 gigs of RAM and 80 gigs of storage. That will be plenty enough for one bot. Then I have to add a label to the bot. This is more of a Linode server management thing, so I can manage different bots on my account. Also if I manage a lot of server instances, I could give the server some tags, but for now I will not do that because I only have one server to manage. Then there is another important thing for me to consider, and that is the root password. I should use a strong password here, made by a password manager for example, as seen on your screen. But since this is a demonstration server, which I will destroy after this video, I'm going to make it a little bit easier for me now. But everybody else should definitely use a strong password here. Now I can also add some SSH keys, additional VLANs, backup services and private IP addresses, but I'm not going to use these, so I will just click on the button to create the Linode and see what happens next. At this moment the server is getting provisioned by the provisioning engine of the node and after a short while the server will be ready to log in via the LSH console that is available top right on the screen. And when the server is running I can log in on the console. Here I can see the booting process of the server and when the server is ready I can log in with my root user and password.
So now that I have a server that is up and running, I can proceed with the next phase. And that is to secure the server before I even actually use it for my services. After I have created the server, my first task is to secure it. Unsecured servers are easily hacked and can be used for all kinds of nefarious things. And in this case it can be even worse because I will put my crypto trading bot on it and it has access to my funds on the exchange. Hackers can alter the bot and will most probably help me get rid of my money and send it to themselves or their friends. A lot of people do not take this part seriously, but I hope you will. So let's start with the first security change. It is not wise to use the root password all the time for managing the server. One incorrect command and you can destroy the whole server. Another issue is, is that the root user is always available on a Linux system. So this user is an easy first target for hackers to attack. To mitigate this risk, I will add another normal user to the system. That I will give elevated rights to act as the root user when needed. This is called sudo and is short for super user2. I can give my new user an obscure name that is not easily guessed as an additional layer of security. But for this demo I will make things easy for me. Now to do all this I have to log in on the server and that I will do with the help of the SSH protocol. So let's do that first. On this page here I can find the IP address of my server. And if I click on the server instance, I can see even more information on how to log in on the server with SSH. So let me copy this command first. And now in my normal computer, I will open the terminal window and paste the command on the prompt. Okay, I'm now logged in on the server and let me change the font size. And now let's check who is logged in at the moment. And according to the output, only I am logged in. So let's check which services are running at the moment. Oh, now I have to change the font size again. Uh, let's see here. This shows the services that are available on the system. Services with a plus are actually running and the services with a minus are stopped. And another way of seeing what is happening on the server is with the help of the htop command. I can see that the server has two processors, 4 gigs of RAM and 512 megabytes of swap configured. And at the moment there are 24 tasks and one program running, which is the htop command itself. So now that I know all this, I can start with my first security task. Let me first rename my server so that I know on which machine I am working. Changing the hostname of this server is not so much of a security task, but it will make things easier later on because I will see on which server I am working. So it is more of a server management hygiene factor. Let's make a copy of the original file first and then change the hostname file content to reflect the real name of this server. In this case I will call it tbot01 for tradingbot1. And then I'll have to reboot the server to make this active. After the reboot I have logged in again to make the necessary alterations. And I can see here that my hostname has been changed so that I can recognize on which server or client I'm working. Now it is time for me to add the new regular user and disable the root user. I will use the following command to create a user with its necessary home directory and files. And of course you should use your own username here. I'll enter the full name here, but I'll skip these other questions for now. After that, I can give the user sudo rights so that it can act on behalf of the root user. Now to test if this user is correctly configured, I can open another SSH session to the server.
Then I can also check if the user has the correct rights. And I'll elevate the user's rights with the use of the sudo command. With that sudo command I should be able to read the contents of the roots directory. Under normal circumstances I cannot read this roots directory. Uh, so let's try this out first. And the system correctly prompts with an error message that says that I do not have enough rights. Now let me try this again, but this time with the sudo command. And now I can look into the roots directory, all because of the sudo command that elevates my rights. Now because this works, I can proceed with the next security item and that is to disable the root user. Now that I am logged in with a new server, which also has the ability to run elevated commands, I can disable the root account for more security. And in my case I have to disable the root account. I can do that with the help of the following command. And after I am finished I can check if the account is successfully disabled by using the following command. And here, the account should be successfully disabled when there is an exclamation mark before the encrypted password. Now I can try to log in with the disabled account to check if I am able to do this. And if the system does not allow this, then it means that I have successfully disabled the root account. If disabling the root account gives me any troubles, I can enable this account again by use of the following command. And of course I can check this again by reading the etcetera shadow file uh, or log into the server with the enabled account again. But in my case I will leave the root user disabled for more security. Now I will check if I can log in with the root account. And it looks like I'm not able to log in, so I think everything is configured correctly. Okay, let's proceed with the next step. The next important security feature I will use is a firewall. I am going to install the uncomplicated firewall or UFW to block traffic to my server. And to test if this firewall is already installed, I can use the following command. And if it does not return anything, then I can install it by using the installation command of the distribution. In the case of the Ubuntu distro, it will be the apt installation command like this. And of course, after I have installed it, I can test again if UFW is installed. Ok, now after installation of the firewall, it is very important that I do these next commands very carefully. Step 1 is to configure the firewall to allow the ports for the SSH server and deny all other traffic by default. Then I can activate the firewall. If I do not do this correctly, then I will lose access to the SSH server and will have to use the console of my service provider to correct this mistake. So let me use the following commands to add the SSH port first and then enable the firewall. And after entering these lines, I can check if the firewall is configured correctly by using the status option. If I want to disable the firewall for some reason, then I can always use the next command. And also I have to be aware that each server I install and want to reach over the internet has to have an open firewall port, otherwise I cannot reach the service. This can be easily done by using the following command. For example, if I want to open a firewall port to a TCP service on port 888, 
then I can use the following command. And if I think this port is incorrectly configured and I want to remove it, then I can use the next two lines to detect which line I have to remove and then finally delete it. And I should always check the configuration afterwards, of course. So now that I have installed the firewall also, the next thing I have to do is configure and secure the services that are reachable from the internet. And in this case, it's only the SSH server I have to configure. But before I even go over the SSH configuration, I should have to consider if I really wanted to make use of the SSH server to manage it from the internet. Because my service provider also gives me the option to manage the server from the console, which adds another layer of security. And in your case, if you are happy with that, then it might be a good idea to disable the SSH service and remove the ports from the firewall altogether. Because the less services you run on the server, the less attack vectors a hacker has on your system. But in my case, I'm keeping the SSH service and will harden its configuration in the next couple of steps. And the first thing I will do is use a SSH key pair and then disable the ability to log in with the username and password. This way a hacker cannot log in by guessing or brute force attacking my server because I do not use passwords in the first place. I will use a file which I own to log in to my server, which is more secure. But I have to be aware that if I lose this file or it gets stolen, then I will be in big trouble. Therefore I will also use a password on this SSH key pair and also put a backup in a safe place, just to be sure. My procedure to create the SSH key pair is to have it created from my client PC. And to create the key pair I will do the following things. First I will make a directory to store all the secure key files and make it only usable for me. So the following command I will use for that. Then I will create the key pair with the following SSH keygen command. I will give my key pair a name and I will also give it a passphrase for security reasons. After the key pair is made, I will upload the key to the server with the next command. And I will use my normal password when uploading the keys. And it does upload, so let's continue. The output suggests that I can log in to my server now with the key pair, so let's try that. I'll open a new terminal window and enter the suggested command after the prompt. And what appears now is a key pair vault from my Linux Mint distribution that saves the key pair password in its cache so that I don't have to use it all the time. And from this moment on, the bot server will also look at my key pair to authenticate me. But I'll have to make a change in my SSH server's configuration to let it make use of only the key and not the password. So to harden the SSH server configuration, I'll have to log into the server. Let me do that with my new key pair option. And I will see that I will not be asked to use my password again. First of all, I'm going to make a copy of the original configuration by using the following command. And after I've done this, it's time to open up the server config and change some lines that makes the server do the following. It disables the root login and allows the configured user to log in on the server. It will disable the use of password authentication and uh, configure maximum authentication retries and it will only use the key file we just created. 
I will also use an obscure port for the SSH server and will disable the X11 protocol and TCP forwarding and also use the SSH protocol too. Now this is not a complete tutorial on how to configure SSH to be the most secure, but if you read some other blogs or tutorials about that, then you will see that these configurations are pretty sufficient to harden your SSH server. Now I have prepared a SSH server configuration file for this purpose, so I will just clear the complete config and paste the contents of the prepared file. This will save me some time and the final config for the SSH server will look like this. I also changed the common SSH port number 22 to be a more obscure port, so that it's not easy to guess and be attacked by potential hackers. In this case I will use the port 1234 for my SSH server. And I have to be careful here that I will not use a port that is already used by another service on my server. Otherwise I will get problems with both services and can potentially lock myself out of the server. But in this case I'll be safe. After I've done this it's time to add the configured port to the firewall. Only after I've done this I can restart the SSH server and not earlier. Because otherwise I might close the access to my SSH server and will lock myself out. And now I can safely restart the SSH server with the following command. Now after it has been restarted I can check and see if there are new open ports on my system. And I can see here that there is a new TCP port opened and listening on the 0000.1234 with the SSHD user. This means that the SSH server is now listening on port 1234 and I can connect with it because my firewall also allows this. So note that I'm still lucky enough to be connected on the older port 22 here. So the next step for me is to log in on the newly configured SSH port on the server and log out on the old SSH session. And then I can safely remove the old SSH firewall rules and that will finish this step in the procedure. So I'll delete the old SSH port from the firewall like this. And then check if the firewall is correctly configured. And by the way, if I made a mistake in this procedure and I would lock myself out, I could always log in on the management console that the node provides. So I always have a backup connection. But if I made this server in another way, like private server, then I would have bigger issues with this. So now that I'm finished with this step, it's time to do the following step and that is enabling the automatic updates. Another security mechanism for my server is to stay up to date with the installed software. Sometimes a new security issue is detected on software and that software should then be patched to disarm the security issue. So regular software updates are therefore mandatory and luckily Linux also has a software package for that purpose. So here I will install that package on my system and activate it so that I do not need to worry about patching my system all the time. Oh well, luckily for me, uh, the server already has this package installed, so let's just continue with configuring it. And to enable automatic updates, I will use this command. And here I will choose yes. And that's it, the automatic updates is enabled. So let's proceed with the next step. And that last item is configuring the NTP server or time service. This will make logging events more precise and will also help the trading bot to make more accurate time-based decisions. 
So first I have to check in which time zone this server is configured with the following command. And the output shows the time zone and if it is already activated and synchronized. Now I can use the following commands to see the symbolic link to which time zone the NTP service is configured. And now at this point I have the question to which time zone should I set the trading bot and therefore the NTP server. So in my case I will change the time zone of my server to use my local time zone. And to do this I'll have to use the following command to see how my time zone is called. And it is Europe Amsterdam. So I have to remember this to make use of this in my next command to set the time zone. And after I've done this, I can now check again if the correct time zone is configured on my system, which it is. Now it's also important that the bot's time is synchronized with the time server. And from the last command I executed, I saw that the system clock is synchronized, but now I want to know with which server. And for that I can use the following command. And I see that it is synchronized with the Ubuntu time server. I want to change this to a close by and European public time server, so I will need to do the following steps to make use of the correct server. For Europe you can see the time servers here on this web page. And then I will add my preferred time server to the NTP config file. Now first make a backup of course and then edit the file. And then I will need to change this file to change the way the NTP server synchronizes. I will use a pre-configured example here. Then I will have to reload the NTP service so that it uses the adjusted configuration file. And as you can see from the output, I am now syncing with the Dutch NTP pool. Also I can use the following command to check once again. And with this last step, I am finished with the initial creation and securing of my trading bot server. Now to summarize what I did, I created a trading bot server at my cloud service provider and I changed the host name. I added a normal user to use on my server and disabled the root user. I configured a firewall and I hardened the SSH server. I also enabled automatic updates. And finally I configured the time service to use a local time server. My opinion is that these steps are mandatory for everybody that wants to make use of an internet connected server for whatever service they want to run on. I will not guarantee that your server cannot possibly be hacked, but you did manage to make things more difficult for potential hackers. Let's now proceed with the next phase and install Docker, Docker Compose and the Fractrate Docker container to run the trading bot with. And because I used Ubuntu, it's quite easy to download and install Docker. This might be completely different for you if you run something else like Red Hat, Arch or even Windows. Follow the instructions for that OS if you need to. But in my case I only have to use the following commands to install Docker and Docker Compose on my system. So let me type these in.
And here I get a warning that there is a new kernel available on my server. I will press OK here for now because I will do that later. And next there is a screen that asks me if I want to restart services. I'll click OK here as well. Now to verify that the installation of docker went correctly, I can download and run a test container. And if it produces output, then everything is correctly installed. So I'll run the docker hello world image to check this. And I can see here that everything is working fine. Okay, now I have this image on my system, but I want to keep my system as clean as possible. So I have to remove the image. And I can do that with the following procedure. First of all, I'm checking the status of all my Docker containers with Docker PS. And if a container is running and I wanted to delete it, then I'll have to stop this first with the docker stop command and then use the docker container ID for that. But in this case, the status is already on exit, so I do not have to stop it. I can simply use the docker rm command to remove the container. Now I can check the downloaded docker images with the docker images command. And now I can delete that image with docker rmi. So from this moment on my system is cleaned from unused docker images and containers. Only the files that you did not save on the docker virtual system will be kept, but I will explain that a little bit later. To install the Fractrate bot docker image, I will follow the procedure that is very well explained on the training bots website. So if you want to know all the details of that procedure, you can look things up on the Fractrate site. But first I'll have to create a new directory that will save files locally and not in the virtual docker environment. I normally create these program directories and files in the slash op directory. Because as far as I know, all third party packages and program files are supposed to be located there for a Linux system. So I go to the slash op directory and create a new directory called ft user data like this. Then I'll have to download the docker compose file from the Fractrate repository. And then I will pull the Fractrate image to my system with the docker compose pull command. Okay, after it's downloaded with the docker images command, I can check if the Fractrate image has been downloaded correctly. And the next thing I'll have to do is create the user directory structure for Fractrate. This structure will be created automatically if I run the Fractrate docker file with an additional create user dir parameter. And the same thing goes for making a complete new config file. Run the docker image of Fractrate again, but this time with a new config parameter to create a new config file. And notice that with each command I use, I use the rm switch. This switch runs the container and then automatically removes the container again after the Fractrate command has been executed. Let's answer these questions with the default settings so that I can create the config file. And after this step, I can start the docker container and run the bot in dry mode. 
But before I do that, I first want to take a look at the docker compose file. In the compose file, I have the option to choose from multiple fractrate images. Each of these images has a special function. The images section can be used to select the functionality the image provides. Now the stable version is the minimal version I need to create, backtest and run a trading strategy. And the develop image is the version where I can develop on if I want to. And the develop plot image has the additional capabilities to plot output of my strategy performances and backtests. The restart option here gives you the control on how the bot should start after for example a crash or a manual reboot. And over here, the volume section gives me the possibility to determine where I want to save my files permanently on my system. Now if this is not correctly configured, then all output will be saved in the docker container itself. And if you restart that container or it crashes, the information will be lost forever. With this dot here, it indicates that everything should be saved in the directory where the docker compose file resides. So in my case the data and all other output of the bot will be placed in the opt ft user data directory. In the ports section I can determine on which IP address and port the bot is reachable. The 127.0.0.1.8080 address is the IP address that maps to the host name localhost on my machine. This tells Docker to only expose the port on the local loopback network interface and nothing else. So my application is only exposed over that interface and since the 127.0.0.1 is only accessible via my machine, my local machine that is, I'm not exposing my container to the entire world. And this last section executes the Fractrate program and contains additional arguments for the bot. You should recognize these options because these are the same as when you started the bot via the standard command prompt without docker. Here I can set where I want to log the output, where I want to save my trades database, which config file to use and where to find it. And finally I can set the strategy I want to use with my bot. In a later stage I can change these settings to run my bot like using another strategy or running two bots with the help of two different docker compose files and two different config files for specific strategies. But I think that's enough information for now. Let me first start the bot with the current settings and see what will happen. And one final remark, you should always start from the directory the docker compose file lives in. So to run the Fractrate bot as a daemon, which is a background service, I use the slash d switch but first I will use the bot without this D option to see the output directly to my screen. If there are any problems with the image or the configuration, then these will show up directly on my terminal screen. And as it seems, everything is working fine. So now that I know that Fractrate is running without any problems, I can start the bot in daemon mode. Running the bot in daemon mode has also additional benefits. Because if I run it with the option to restart unless stopped, Docker will also start the bot after a reboot. As long as the Docker service itself is also set to start after a reboot of course. Now let me stop this running instance with Ctrl C. And then start the container again in daemon mode with the daemon switch. And if everything went well, the bot is now running in the background. I can check this by running the docker ps command. And I can also check the output of the running daemon logs with the logs switch. Or what I also can do is see the docker container logs like this. First get the container id with ps and then check the container logs itself. And the final check to see if the Fractrate bot is running is checking the output of the Fractrate bot to its own log files with the tail command. And you can see over here that there is output as well. Now Fractrate is regularly updated with new functions, security and bug fixes. So it's wise to frequently check their GitHub repository for the latest version. 
Now if there is a new version available and I want to make use of that, I can update the docker image with the following procedure. First stop the bot with the down option, and then update the image by pulling it again. And finally I can start the bot again in daemon mode. It is always smart to check the new version's change log and then decide if an update to the latest image is really necessary. And if you are really careful, then you can use multiple stages before you update your production bot. This means that you first check the updated docker image in a test environment and see if it all goes well. Then you can create a backup of your production environment. And finally update that environment to use the newest bot image. But for now with this last step, my bot is fully functional and running. Now it is time to start with part 3 of this tutorial. And there I'm going to go through some of the more important configuration options to consider. I will also configure the bot's web and telegram interface for remote management. So let's proceed with part 3. Installation of an automated trading bot is one, but configuring it to make optimal use of its functionalities is another thing. Since Fractrade has so many options to consider, it would take me hours to explain everything. So therefore, I will only stick to the most necessary options to consider before running my bot in production. The first question is whether I want to do spot trading or futures trading. With spot trading, I will only have the possibility to go long on the market. In other words, if markets are bullish, then I can buy assets and profit from positive market sentiment. But when markets are bearish, I have no buy signals. The bot stays dormant and I will do nothing with the money on my account balance. This could also be considered opportunity costs. In the case of futures trading, I can profit from bull markets, but also from bear markets. In other words, I can buy assets to go long in positive markets and I can sell assets to go short in negative market conditions. So I can make money either way. This whole principle is for somewhat more experienced traders, but can nonetheless make big money if things are done correctly. And also, the exchange has to support futures trading of course. The default config.json file is configured to do only spot trading. That is, it goes only long when markets go up. To enable short trading as well, I have to change some settings in the config file and the strategy file. And I'll follow the Fractrade documentation here, which can be found on the following web page. Now first make a backup of the original config file. And then open the file and change the following settings. Here I will set the trading mode to futures and the margin mode to isolated. And by the way, at the moment of this recording, these are the only two available options to short. Next I should change my strategy file. The strategy class also has to contain the option can short equals true. And the strategy should also contain the enter short signal. But I will show you that later in this tutorial. So for now this was a quick demonstration on how to change the config file and strategy file to be able to do futures trading. Also backtesting with futures strategies will also require that I have to download the futures data. This futures dataset is totally different from the spot trading data and might also not be available for all the pairs or also over the longer time periods. Let me open the config file again to run through some other options that I will have to consider when trading with the bot.
The Max Open Trades line should look familiar because I have already said this when I created this config file. Here I determine how many open trades I want to have open at any given time. The default is 3, but I can configure as many as I like. I have to keep in mind that under certain market circumstances all pairs will act the same, especially when markets go down rapidly. So having many open trades does also give me higher risks. Then there is the stake currency I have to consider. If it is my goal to attain as much Bitcoin as possible, then I will use the BTC quote currency. Otherwise I can use a stable coin like USDT. My choice of quote currency is also dependent on the exchange I use. I can check the CCXT library and my exchange to find out more about that. For this example I will keep the USDT as quote currency and use the other crypto as base currency to trade. The stake amount is the amount of money I want to use for each trade. So if I put 100 here, it means that I use 100 USDT for every trade. No matter how much money I have on my trading account balance. Setting the stake amount to unlimited will work in combination with the earlier configured max open trades. So when I have a thousand USDT on my account, then this will be divided by the open trades I have set. Which in this case is around 333 USDT. And this amount will then be used for each trade. The advantage here is that this way my account balance will compound quickly when things go well. But when markets turn, I will be trading with large stake amounts, which will drain my account quickly again. So I should be aware of this. Also, this stake amount works in combination with the tradable balance ratio, which I will discuss next. It is unwise to use all my trading accounts money for trading. At least I should have to spare some money to take care of the exchange's trading fees. To do this, I can make use of the tradable balance ratio. If I set this to 0.99, then I will use 99% of my account to trade. And if I set this to 0.95, then I will use 95% of my account. So for another example, if I set my ratio to 0.99% as in the default config, and when I have $1000 on my trading account, I will actually use $990 to trade and keep the 1% for fees and stuff. Now this ratio also has a direct influence on the unlimited stake account because I will actually use $990 divided by the max open trades. So this will then result in $330 per trade. And again, these trading amounts are not fixed but will grow or shrink as your account grows or shrinks. I should use the dry run and dry run wallet settings when I want to forward test a strategy. Forward testing is a method to test out the strategy and the real market circumstances to see if the strategy also holds true. When this dry run option is set to true, the bot then simulates real trading with a starting balance that I have set in the dry run wallet parameter. And when I have concluded that the strategy really works under actual market circumstances, then set this dry run setting to false. This way I tell the bot to trade for real and it will use my real actual balance on my trading account. An additional configuration option I might consider is using the available capital option. This option tells the bot to only use the configured capital for trading no matter what my trading balance is. This option could be used if I wanted to use two bots or more on my account and want to give each of them a certain portion of my balance to trade with. So for example, if I have 1000 USDT on my balance and want to use two bots with different strategies, then I could give ETH bot 500 USDT as available capital for trading. The next thing to think about is the entry and exit pricing. Here I decide if I want to make use of the order book and at which side of the order book I want to set my entry and exit pricing. And if you don't know what an order book is or how it works, then watch my video about that subject. And of course another source of information is the frag trade side itself. In the exchange section, I have to set the exchange where the bot will be trading on. If everything went correctly during the installation phase, I already answered the question on which exchange I want to trade. In this section I also can set the API key and secret I configured on my exchange. 
otherwise the bot is not authorized to trade on my account and will not work. Fractrade makes use of the CCXT library for connecting with the trading exchanges. I can set additional CCXT configuration options in these CCXT config and ASIC config lines. This might also come in handy if I'm going to use an exchange that has not been tested and approved by the Fractrade developers. Another thing I have to decide is to make use of the volume pair list or static pair list. The Fractrade bot creates the default config.json file with the volume pair list configured. This pair list is a dynamic list that sorts and filters pairs based on their trading volume. I can configure additional options like the number of assets to watch, the minimum volume the pair is traded with and the way this pair list gets sorted. If I prefer to trade only certain crypto pairs, I can use the static pair list for that. This static pair list only makes use of the pairs that are configured in the whitelist. I can also set additional pairs I do not want to trade in the blacklist. And I can also filter and sort the static pairs with the age filter, price filter, spread filter, volatility filter and more. But for more information about that, again see the Fractrade site. The most important thing to know here is that I cannot backtest or download data when I have configured the volume pair list. This is only possible with the static pair list enabled. Now I will not go over the edge configuration, that's a little bit too difficult for this video, but I will go to the last section of this configuration file and here I can set the name of the bot. I can also set the initial state the bot starts with if I start the docker container or service. So for example I can start the docker container of Fractrade, but it will be in a state of stopped. So it does not make trades at that moment. It only makes trades if I explicitly tell it to. If I want to configure the bot to accept RPC trade entry commands through the REST API or Telegram, then set the force entry enable setting to true. This is more of a security setting because if this is enabled, I could force the bot to enter a position, even though the strategy does not have signals for buying. But if I did a forced buy this way, then the regular strategy exit signals will exit the position. I can also set the internal iteration loop for the bot. The default setting here is 5 seconds. Setting this to 60 will set the bot iterate through its complete process every 60 seconds. Now other options I could add to this section are the heartbeat interval, which prints a message to the console or log, or configuring the location of the config file, strategy file and logging file. And I can also specify the database name and location here. But since these are already configured in the docker compose file, I do not add these here to the config file. It would only lead to confusion and configuration problems. There is however one thing that I would like to mention here and that is the possibility to use multiple configuration files to configure the bot. A practical application of multiple configuration files is the use of a separate file for security items like API identifiers, secret keys, usernames and more. I can add the security configuration file to the bottom of the original config.json file like this. And next I will have to create the private config file itself to let it have all the private information. I will just make a copy of the original config file here and delete all the unnecessary lines. And of course in a real situation I would then add all of the private keys and stuff in this file. But I can always do that later, this is just for the demonstration. Now I can bring down the bot and restart it again with the config.json file, which will also use the new private config. And 
and as I can see on the screen, I do not get any errors. Let me stop this bot again and show you another way of using a private file. And that is by adding the private config to the docker compose file as an additional starting option. First I'll remove the add config files from the bots config file. And then add it as an additional config option in the compose file here. It's nice to know that if a key is in more than one of the configurations, then the last specified configuration wins. So in this example, the config private configuration items take prevalence over the config.json file. Using this technique allows me to save, backup or share my complete fractrate config.json to the public cloud without having to worry about my security information. Now let me start the bot one more time to see if everything is working alright. And it looks like this. When I installed Fractrate with the Linux script, then I had to install the web interface for the bot separately. For Docker users however, this web interface is already installed in the stable image and I only have to enable this. If everything goes well, I do not have to change the firewall settings. Docker will take care of the firewall. First of all, I set the API server enabled switch to true, so that it will start when I start the Docker image. And then I will have to make sure that the listen IP address is set to 0000. Leaving this to 127 is perfect when I open the web interface from the local server. But since I am using a virtual server on the internet, I want to reach this from another client. Setting this to zeros makes Fractrate listen to all the interfaces instead of only the local host. Then I have to decide if I will leave the port number to 8080 or just want to use an obscure port so that is not easily found by hackers or other occasional visitors. But for this demonstration I will leave this port to its default setting. Next I have to decide whether to use OpenAPI or not. Now I will not use the REST API at this time, so I will leave that setting to false. The secret key and token will not be used, but for additional security I will change some of these numbers random, just to be sure. I am not using multiple bots this time, so I will not use the course origin option. But if I wanted to make use of multiple bots and wanted to reach them through one single web interface, then I had to use this option. You can find more information on this subject in my Fractrate Multibot video. What I do want to configure is the username and password for obvious reasons of course. I'm using a simple combination in this example, but I should make this more complicated in a production environment of course. So now that these items are configured, the bot can be started. If I look at the output on my screen, I will see that the API server is enabled and that the HTTP server is reachable on port 0000-8080. The next step is to make a change to the docker compose file to make the server also reachable from the internet. And I will have to make a similar change to that, so that it matches the Fractrate configuration. The four zeros will also make this image reachable from the internet. So if everything goes well, then the port is open and reachable through the internet. Let me check if the port is available with the netstat command. And everything looks like it's working. So now comes the proof of the pudding, let's check if I can reach this bot from my PC. I will open a browser and try to connect to the bot over the internet. For that I'll have to use the public IP address of my server and the port number configured. And it looks like I've reached the bot. Let's click on the login button top right 
configure the bot name and use the user password combination and then click OK to log in. And let's click on some of the menus top left. And I now can give myself a pat on the back. I have now configured my bot to be managed through the web interface. However, be very aware though that all traffic is over the insecure HTTP protocol. So all my traffic can be intercepted and read as plain text. It is possible to use the Nginx or Apache web server to create a proxy and make the connection to the bot go over the encrypted HTTPS protocol. I will not cover this in the tutorial though. Also, I could use a DNS name for my server so that I do not need to remember the IP address. But this is more of an additional suggestion. Now let me configure another way to control my bot and that is by making use of Telegram. Telegram is a messaging service like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger to send control messages to the bot. To enable this feature I have to open the config private.json file again and adjust the following Telegram section settings. The first thing I have to do is set enabled to true and then get the token and chat ID. Now to do that I should have Telegram installed and configured on my phone, otherwise it will not work. Then I will have to go to the Telegram web interface and after I have logged in I get a screen with my contacts on the left and my conversations on the right. Now I will need to start a chat with the Telegram bot father here or search bot father in the search bar top left. I already used the bot father so I only have to open that channel again and when the bot father is activated I can send the message slash new bot to create a new bot. The bot father will then respond with a question how to call the bot and then I can type a name. Then the bot father asks for a username which has to end with bot uh, and it's possible that somebody already used that name so I have to come up with something unique. And if everything is correct the bot father will congratulate me and I will receive a small description of things I can do with the bot. This is the token I have to use in my config or config private file to enable the bot. This is a confidential token so I have to keep it safe and to myself. And I will paste this token into my config file first. Now it is time to get the user ID of the bot channel. For that I have to talk with the get ID bot. Now because I also already used this bot earlier I can find it in my contacts list. But if you don't have this bot then search for it in the search bar top left. I can get my ID by using the add get ID bot command. And then the result I can use in my config file chat ID section like this. And what I also can do is configure a custom telegram keyboard for my phone with the commands that I regularly use. So let me put these in the config as well. And of course there are many more configuration options for Telegram. See the frag trade site for that. Now save the config file. I am almost ready to run my bot. But before I do that it's time to activate my bot chat. Otherwise frag trade does not recognize this channel. So let me get back to the Telegram interface and open my newly configured bot channel. I have to start this chat with the slash start command. And now it's time to start the trading bot on my server. Here I can see from the output that Telegram has been configured and the bot listens to Telegram commands. So this seems to be looking good. And off screen I am sending some commands with my Telegram app on my phone to the bot. Uh, let me open the web interface again and let's send some commands to the bot. You can see I can also tell the bot to temporarily stop with trading and also start it again. And the logging output on my screen also shows which commands are sent to the bot. So this all seems to be looking very well. And here I'm at the end of this part about the configuration of the trading bot. 
As mentioned earlier, I have not explained each and every configuration option and I also did not explain all the details of each option I did talk about. The default configuration file should be sufficient to run a basic bot, but if you have considered all the settings I demonstrated in this tutorial up until this point, then you should have a pretty well configured trading bot for production usage. So now let's proceed with part 4 of this tutorial, where I will show you more of the commands that can be used to prepare yourself for trading strategy development. The installation of the Fractrade bot is now ready and I can run and manage the bot with all kinds of interfaces. Now it is time to make use of the other possibilities the program has to offer like downloading data, running backtests, optimizing parameters and creating plots for analysis. And again, take note that I use the RM switch in every command. I already showed you the execution of this create user dir and create config commands. These commands create the basic Fractrade structure needed to store files locally and run the bot. After this creation of the directory and config file, I can now start with the download of data from the configured exchange. The Fractrade installation page already gives a docker compose command that I can use to download backtest data for the ETH BTC pair over the last 5 days on the 1 hour time frame. I can also change this line to reflect multiple pairs, a time range and multiple time frames. The date range here is from the 1st of November till the 1st of December 2022 and the time frames are the 1 hour, 4 hour and 1 day time frame. Now that I have data downloaded, I can test a strategy on its performance. During the creation of the user directory structure, a test strategy has been installed in the user data strategies directory. This sample strategy can be used as a template for new strategies or just to test the installation with. So let me backtest this strategy against the downloaded pairs and data. And as I can see here, I get a result back from the backtesting engine. In this case the backtest over a month of data. This strategy has a small loss of 5% but that does not matter, it's just a demonstration. Now I want to demonstrate you what would happen if I did not change this config file to use static pairs but kept it in its original volume pairs list configuration. Let me change the config file back to these original settings and see what happens. And then do a backtest with this configuration. From the output I see that the backtest errors, with a message that it cannot backtest with the volume pairs list option. So backtesting can only be done with a static pair list. This is because the volume pair list option looks at the pairs that have the highest volume at the time of polling the exchange. Now these pairs can change every time and it's almost impossible for the program to download all the necessary data for these pairs at the time the backtest is executed. Therefore I have to change the config file back to the static pair list again and configure some pairs I want to backtest, which I already did of course. And now I can download data for these pairs with the download data command. And take note here that I did not specify the exchange or the pairs in this command. These are all configured in the config file that I refer to. Let me test this strategy against the data and see how the hypothetical performance would be over the month November. Again here I am running the docker container with the RM switch and this time I am calling the backtesting function. And here I have the backtest results. Now I can think about improving this strategy by changing its parameters to let it hopefully perform better. Improving parameters can be done by making an educated guess and then majorly adjusting the strategy's parameters and again make a backtest to see if the performance improves or not. 
but I can also use machine learning to find the best performing indicator settings. And for this I can use the hyperparameter optimization function in Fractrate, which I explained in an earlier YouTube video. But for this to work the strategy also have to be adjusted to make optimization work for the parameters. And luckily for me the sample strategy also has some indicators that can be optimized. After optimization has finished, the results of the optimizations are stored in the separate JSON file. This file will be read when the backtest is run and all the settings that are located in this JSON file will overwrite the settings in the original strategy. So if I do another backtest, but this time with the results of the optimization session, then I can see that some adjustments to the strategy's parameters will improve the strategy's results to let it make a 3.5% profit. After I have done backtesting, I can also see some graphs to visualize what happens while executing trades. Where did trades start and where did they stop? And is there some sort of visual pattern to spot when things go wrong or right? And so on. Well, unfortunately at this stage I cannot create plots because the following things. I used the Fractrate Docker image without the plotting capability. And I am on a server where the plotting output cannot be opened, unless I make some sort of a web server to browse them. So at this stage I am a little bit stuck on showing to plot the output from a server instance. However I can plot output from a local docker installation from my laptop for example. And fortunately I created such a thing. I am a little bit unsure if this will work correctly on a windows pc. But I could always create a virtual server with Linux on that PC, or I could use the Windows subsystem for Linux. So to be able to plot output locally on my machine, I should use the Fractrate Compose file with the plotting image enabled. I'll have to comment out the stable image and then uncomment the develop plot image. And then save the file and do a docker pull. And then I can check the image if it's downloaded. And I can see here that the docker develop plot image is downloaded and it's also a little bit larger than the stable version. At this stage I can proceed with plotting a data frame of a backtest. Now I already have made some adjustments to make this installation work and download the, the necessary data on my local PC. So let me backtest the optimized strategy first with this image to see if everything is working correctly. And after confirmation that everything is working, I can start making plots of specific pairs and see how they behave with the certain strategies. Here I use the sample strategy again and create a 1 hour time frame plot of the BTC USDT pair. And after the plot has been created I can open the HTML file after searching for it in my file browser. These plots are located in the Fractrate plots directory. And if I double click on the file, the browser will open it for me. Now there are multiple options for creating plots, so if you want to know more about these options, then please watch my in-depth video on plotting charts with the Fractrate bot. I can also try to figure out what the performance is of my total portfolio. To be able to do that, there is another plotting option which is called Plot Profit. This plot takes the performance of all the configured pairs and shows the total performance. To be able to create a profit plot, I have to copy some backtest output information to use in the plot profit command. This is because the plot profit command has to have the backtest result information to create this plot. 
So after I have copied the output file name, I can then use this in my create plot profit command here. And this plot will also be saved in the same directory as the plot data frame function. So again, watching this plot is simply a matter of opening the generated HTML file. So in this part, I demonstrated some of the commands I used the most for my backtesting videos. And of course, there are numerous combinations to make of the commands and their switches. So if you want to know what options each command has, then use the help function that Fractrate has, like this. Or this command. Now that I have a fully functional bot which automatically can run algorithmic trading strategies, wouldn't it be nice to develop my own trading strategy? And you're in luck because in this short introduction I will go over the basics of algorithmic trading strategy development so that you have a small foundation to build on. In this demonstration I will show you how you can create a strategy that goes long or short with futures trading. And to be able to do that, I first have to make some alterations to the config.json file of the bot to tell it to make use of futures trading. So for that I have to change the following lines, from spot to futures and isolated. Also, I'll have to make sure that I have some static pairs listed so that I can download the necessary data for backtesting. Then I can start downloading futures backtest data for the pairs I have configured in the config.json file. Already downloaded spot data will not be used when backtesting a futures enabled strategy, so I will have to do this again. And the futures data will be downloaded in a separate futures data directory. The next thing for me to do is creating a new strategy file. To do that, I'll have to make use of the next command. Here I create a new strategy called new strategy with the advanced strategy template. This is only necessary if you want to create a strategy file which contains all kinds of examples and indicators. But if you want a smaller and cleaner file, then you have to omit the template switch. Now in preparation of this video, I cleaned up my new strategy file and called it my strategy, so that I can adjust this further to make it a long and short trading strategy. So let me open my cleaned up file to explain which sections there are. The first section of this file contains the libraries that are necessary for strategy execution. Only the bottom three libraries are optional here. And I can replace these with my own preferred TA libraries. Then there is a whole section that determines what are called the global strategy variables. The most important parameters to consider here are the time frame this strategy should be working on. If it is a strategy that can also do shorts in case of futures trading, like we are going to do. And time-based ROI sell percentages, where the bot closes the position if the trade has a certain profit level after a certain amount of time. The stop loss settings, where the bot closes the position if the trade has a certain configured loss percentage. If the strategy makes use of trading stop loss settings and some parameters where I determine if the strategy should use its exit signals and only exit the position if there is a profit. And here the amount of candles to process before the strategy can create valid signals. With this section I determine what order types I want to use when buying and selling asset pairs. And finally here are some high propped space settings that are in the file so that this strategy can be optimized if I want to. The next section is used to determine which indicators I am going to use in this strategy. At this moment only the RSI is configured here as an example, 
but if you watch my other videos then you would see that you can go completely nuts in this section. Then the final section here contains the entry and exit trend functions. Because this strategy can either go long or short depending on the market conditions, there is a enter long and enter short section in the entry trend function. And the same thing goes for the exit trend. For both long and short trades there are exit conditions. Now let me change this file so that I can make a simple long and short trend writing strategy based on the 50 day simple moving average. The strategy is as follows. I will use the one day time frame and to enter a trade I will enter long when the close price of an asset closes above the 50 SMA and I will enter short when the close price of an asset closes or crosses below the 50 SMA and to exit the trade I will exit long signals when the close price of an asset closes or crosses below the 50 SMA. And the same goes for the shorts. These are closed when the asset closes or crosses above the 50 SMA. The initial stop loss setting is to close when the position here has a 10% loss after the trade signal. And I will set the ROI to sell when there is a 100% profit after the trade signal. And I will keep this strategy simple, so I will not use Hyperopt to optimize. Only the 50 SMA will suffice for this strategy. So now I will code this strategy as follows. I will set the time frame to one day. I will set the shorting options to true in the strategy file. Then I will set the minimal ROI to 100% reached. and I will set the stop loss to 10%. The RSI hyperopt spaces will be removed. And then I will change the RSI indicator in the populate indicator section to the SMA indicator and add the time period parameter to the indicator. Then I will configure the trade parameters for long and short trading. For long trades the close price should cross above the 50 SMA. And to go short, the close price should cross below the 50 SMA. And I will set the sell signals to the opposite of the buy signals. So to exit a long trade, the price should cross below the 50 SMA. And to exit the short, the close price should cross above the 50 SMA. So with this strategy, on an asset pair I am either long or short, but I will not be at the sidelines without any trade. Let me test if this strategy is working or not with the help of a backtest. Oh, and before I do that, I just realized that my dataset is a little bit too small to do a backtest of the uh, SMA 50 strategy. So I think I will download one day data from around the beginning of the last bear market up until the day I prepared this video. I can see here from the output on the screen that the actual BTC USDT data for backtests starts around September 2019. And that's probably the date where futures trading became available on the exchange. And I see that the other data pairs have even shorter datasets. So unfortunately this is all the data I can backtest on. 
Now that I have a somewhat representative dataset for this demonstration, let me now do a backtest to see if this trading strategy has a probability to make me some money in the future. And what a surprise, this strategy actually does make money. Apparently this super simple trading strategy had a profit of 373%. Important data points that I use most from these outputs are the amount of profit, the drawdown and win rate of the strategy. And I also think it is important to know which pairs do not respond to the strategy. There is no one size fits all and sometimes a popular strategy simply does not work on a certain pair. That's important to find out before I start real trading with my actual money. If I had developed and tested this strategy on my local machine, then I could have made use of the plotting capabilities I showed earlier. It would help me to analyze what's happening with the strategy even more. And even the backtesting command has more options that I just used. I can do for example also create performance overviews by day, week or month like this. But I think this is enough for now for this section and I think you are getting the general idea here. Now you know a little bit about creating and coding a strategy to go long and short on asset pairs. I'm coming to the end of this video and want to finish it with some final words before I leave you on your journey to create the most profitable and perfect automatic algorithmic trading bot and strategy. And that is to be very careful with what you do. Algorithmic bot trading sounds like there is easy money to earn, but it is actually very hard work and not as simple as one might think. The chances are higher that you lose money before you gain anything, and consider this the school of hard knocks. After a year of studying, coding, installing, testing, fixing and testing algorithmic strategies, I am still learning each and every day. And I realize that I am still scratching the surface and that there is much more to learn than I ever imagined. New technologies are developed every day and can benefit the search for the optimal algo trading strategy, but it's not easy. The most important message I have to say here is to stay curious, eager to learn and do not give up. Finding a good strategy is harder than you think, and all the blogs, posts and videos that get produced and promises you 99% win rates should be taken with much skepticism. It looks so easy to find a winning strategy until you rigorously test it and find out it was not that profitable under your specific circumstances. Even your own strategies that performed great a year ago might not ever be profitable again in the future. Be aware of these facts. And you are also free to question my videos and the results I show you as well. However, I want to keep things realistic and also provide you with the actual outputs I get from the bot, so that you can check yourself if my conclusions are incorrect. My view is that a dialogue between my audience and myself around these results is the best way to find the best algo strategy. And everybody can profit from these interactions. So therefore, I want to thank you all for your support, feedback, likes and more. And wish you all the best at building your bot. May the next bull market be one that makes us all moonwalkers. Good luck and goodbye. And don't forget to like, subscribe, click the bell and comment of course.